Heads up. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm getting the thumbs up. It's time to start, so welcome. Uh, we'll always be starting right on time because you know we are, of course, live streaming this. So uh, hello, everybody who's watching online. We're glad that you're with us today as well. Um, and we're digging into the Gospel of John. Uh, those of you who are here, there are some sheets that you'll need at each corner here in the front. If you want to grab one of those at either place, uh, we should be good to go. Um, it's nice that our uh, wonderful homeschooler who are uh, warming us up with some recorder or I think it's an iron flute or something. I don't know what it is, but thankful for them. Uh, and good to be with you. Uh, we are working through John today. We're going to conclude uh, the fourth chapter of John. Um, kind of fun how uh, you might remember, uh, if, if you're with me in my Tuesday night class, we spent one class on the whole Gospel of John. Man, we just flew through that, didn't we? We're spending about 38 classes on the Gospel of John on Tuesday morning, so we get to dig a little bit deeper. But we're still not quite on the level of Pastor Brinkman. <laughs> that dude's been working in the Gospel of Matthew, and he's in the 108th week of the Gospel of Matthew. How in the world is that even possible? I don't know. But um, they must do like one verse each day. I don't know. So we're not on the Paul Brinkman schedule, but we're, we're digging into John a little deeper than we did at least in our Growing Through the New Testament class. Um, so today we'll be at uh, John chapter 4, verses 43 to 54. And again, if you're online, that material is available for you on our website. You can download that and have it with you as we're working through stuff um, uh, in our class together. So if you know me, you know before we start, what do we always have to do? Get prayed up and ready for what God has for us. So let's bow our heads. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, God, uh, thank you for the time we have to be together again this day. Uh, it is a joy and a delight to just be together. I've said this like a thousand times already, God, you know it, uh, how much more I appreciate being able to be together since we weren't able to do it in this last couple of years or so. So thank you, God, for just brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the friendship we share for the new friends, for the new folks that are with us today, for new opportunities to be the body of Christ together. Uh, but most of all, God, we thank you for being able to gather around your word. Uh, we don't just gather together today to, to talk about the Packers, although that's not a bad idea, or to talk about uh, what we're having for dinner tonight, uh, but we gather around your word, God. We gather to be filled with the gift of you speaking to us through your very own inspired and errant infallible word. So God, never ever let us take that for granted uh, and be thankful for this word. And pray that you would now open our hearts and our minds to that word, that it might find a place to grow and take root and uh, give us all that we need for life in the kingdom and uh, enable us to serve you better. So today as we look at Jesus' great teaching with this man who had this very sick son. We pray that you would help us see past the illness to what this man really needed, his faith to grow, uh, to know your son Jesus as his savior. And perhaps, Lord, as we dig through that ourselves, we'll see that what we need in life is more than just the miracles, more than just the prayers that we ask for, uh, but deeper miracle of faith and trust and confidence uh, that you are God and that you are with us all the time. So use this word to deepen our faith just as you used it to deepen um, Herod's officials' faith as well. So bless us as we learn, as we grow, as we share, as we enjoy your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Forgive me, everybody. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? It's this new day in which we live. All right, everybody, so get your Bibles out to John chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 43 till 54, so that's the back half of John chapter 4, and then we'll unpack it verse by verse together, all right? Now, just by way of context, just kind of remember uh, where we were last time in John chapter 4. Jesus had just spent time in, in um, Samaria with that Samaritan woman at the well, and now he moves from Samaria up further north to Galilee. And on the way, he confronts, as we're going to see, this 
uh, official from Herod's court who has a special request for him. So, John chapter 4, beginning with verse 43. After the, after the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and all his household believed. And this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea, to Galilee. And this is our text. All right. Aren't you just smiling already? Can't you wait to dig into this and just find out more about this great miracle and what it meant and uh, and how, you know how whenever we read the Bible, you know it's not just a story of the past because what do we always say? The Bible is a living word, right? It's not a dead historical document that tells about things that happened long, long ago but it's a document that is alive still. So as we learn about this official, uh, we're also going to learn about ourselves, aren't we? As we learn how God worked through his son Jesus in that man's life, we're also going to learn how God works through his son Jesus in our lives. And isn't that why we love the Bible? Right? It's, It's not just a historical document, but it is alive and living and still works in our hearts and lives too, right? Can I get amen, everybody? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so let's start then. As we start with verse 43 to 45, I love this. After the two days, he left for Galilee. What are the two days? Right, if you look up a little little, uh, earlier in the context, remember, Jesus had just uh, had this conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. She goes and tells the whole village, and they all come to know Jesus and love him and believe that he's the Messiah, the Christ, and they urge him to stay with him. And what does it say in verse 42? Right, they said, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves. So look ahead to verse 40. When the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed how long? Two Two days. So there's your two days. After two days of of just ministering and loving the Samaritans. And wouldn't you love to have been a part of that? Wouldn't you love to just sat in that crowd as Jesus explained to them, you know, that God wasn't just the God of the Jews? Wouldn't you love to hear him explain that the promised Messiah came not just to die and save Jewish people, but to die and save Samaritans, right? Even people who had five husbands and was living with one who wasn't her husband, right? Wouldn't you love to have heard that conversation? And look what it did. The whole village came to faith. So after those two glorious, awesome days, Jesus moves. And it says, he left for Galilee. So I thought it would be good if we just kind of got our bearings of the geography of things, right? So your very last page, right? I I just printed off a copy for you of a map of sort of the area that Jesus is doing his ministry, right? And so you can get your bearings. You see the Sea of Galilee in the north. Follow the Jordan River as it flows south to the Dead Sea there below. Do you see that? 
If you go to the Dead Sea and you go straight to the west, you'll see Jerusalem. See that there? We all know Jerusalem, right? Go north from Jerusalem into the area of Judea. Go north from Judea, you go into the area of Samaria. And if you look at Samaria, do you see Sychar and Mount Gerizim? That was last week when we talked about the Samaritan woman. It was in Sychar, that's the village, that Jesus stayed for two days. And then it says, after the two days, he moved from Sychar into the area of Galilee. And we're going to see in a little bit, as we heard, that he stops at Cana in Galilee. Do you see that there up in the north? Right, do you see where Cana is? And then we're here, he meets an official who traveled from Capernaum to Cana because his son was sick. Do you see Capernaum north of the Sea of Galilee? Right, so now you kind of have your bearings. But here's what really helps me out. When I see a map, it, it, I need to know, like, how far things are. How big is this? Right? So if you were just to think from Cana in Galilee to Jerusalem, right, that's the distance from Appleton to North Fond du Lac. Right? So just put that in your mind, right? That's the size of the map that we're looking at. It's about 40 miles, 35, 40 miles from Cana to Jerusalem in that area. So, you know, it's not a giant place that we're talking about here, right? We're just talking about a distance of 40 miles, you know? And the, and the space from Nazareth, uh, excuse me, from, from Cana to Capernaum is maybe just 15 miles or so, something like that. So you can kind of get your bearings about what we're talking about. So how long would it take for someone to walk... <laughs> from Jerusalem to like, let's say, Sychar, or from Sychar to Cana, right? The average, they say, I don't know if this is true, but they say the average walk, right, for someone to walk about 20 miles would take about seven hours. Do you think you could do 20 hours in seven miles? Seven miles in, tw in uh, 20 miles in seven hours, you think you could pull that one off? Well, well these were hardy people, weren't they? they yeah. That was what they did. They That's did. just what they did. Or if you, if you were blessed and had like a horse and chariot, you could do that baby in like three hours, 20, 20 miles. You're right. You got the chariot, right? Um, so, you know, it's not like you just jump in the car and drive to Fond du Lac, <laughs> right? If they're going to travel from, from, from Cana to Sychar, which Jesus is moving, right? You know, that's, that's a good day's walk is what we're talking about, right? So you can kind of get your bearings of the places where we're going and kind of get a grip of how things work. That's the, that's the physical bearing, just how big is Israel. But there's also two other sort of spiritual bearings I'd like to get on your sheet. You see there's two other patterns to notice. I, I just want you to kind of check John's movement here in, in these chapters, these first four chapters. Remember if you're filling in blanks, John is sort of starting in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem where he cleanses the temple in John chapter 2. It's in Jerusalem in John chapter 3 where he has the, the conversation with Nicodemus, those great words where he shares with Jesus the words we love, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the John 3.16. Right? That's in, in Jerusalem with Nicodemus. Then he moves from Jerusalem and he moves to Judea in chapter 3 verse 22, I think. Right, you want to just look at 3.22. You can see how John shows us the movement here. After this, this is the conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and did some baptizing. Right? So he moves from Jerusalem further north. Remember your map that we just looked at? Up into Judea. And then he moves, as we just heard, from Judea into, uh, into Galilee. Did you hear that? He's moving even further north uh, in, through Samaria. That's, um, excuse me, the blank should be Jerusalem, Judea. Your third, second blank to fill in is Samaria. And then finally into Galilee itself. So John's got this movement of Jesus as he's moving from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to Galilee. Now here's why I think this is kind of cool. If you remember Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus says to his disciples, and you will receive the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, and you are to go, and how were they, were to, how were they to go? Remember what it said in Acts 1.8? 
go from Jerusalem to to Judea to Samaria to the very ends of the earth. So Jesus sends us, sends them, sends us out on the same path that John shows Jesus going. This is just one of these cool examples that I always get excited about, right? That, That Jesus rarely asks us to do something that he doesn't show us how to do first. It's rare that Jesus doesn't do something or ask us to do something that he hasn't somehow empowered us or gifted us or taught us or shown us what to do. So isn't it cool? This is the direction Jesus moves with his ministry, and this is the same thing that example he tells us, to go from Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. I love it when those sort of things happen. Almost like somebody had a plan. (laughs) Duh, right? You know, the more we study the Bible, isn't it, the more we learn that every word, every movement of Jesus has a purpose, has a reason. Uh, And I think we can see the movement here is showing us again, as I wrote, that Jesus is revealing himself to wider and wider circles of people. He's moving from Jerusalem and the Jewish folks out into Samaria and the Samaritans. And he's moving from the Samaritans out even to a wider group of Gentiles who lived in Galilee. So the circle is widening with the good news, the gospel of Christ. Isn't that cool? Right, so Jesus went to Galilee uh, uh, sort of to delay the honor of the crowds. What I meant by that is, you know, if he would have stayed in Jerusalem, two things would have happened. They either would have tried to make him a king Right? The people would have rallied behind and tried to make him their king, or they would have crucified him. <laughs> right? And he was, he was ready for neither of these two things to happen. It wasn't time yet. He had just begun his ministry. It wasn't time for him to be made king. It wasn't time for him to be crucified yet. I mean, he knew that time was coming, didn't he? So he needed to get out of there. He needed to move. And so he moves up into Galilee And again, if you're following the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, they talk about a three-year ministry of Jesus before he was crucified, from his baptism to his crucifixion. And of those three years, uh, 16 months is spent in Galilee. It's called the Great Galilean Ministry. 16 months of Jesus' ministry, of his three years, right, is spent in the region of Galilee in the synoptics. However, John... This is really something. John, who we know, is not chronological like the synoptics. John only tells two stories or teachings of Jesus in Galilee. Do you know what the two are? The one that we're looking at right now and the feeding of the 5,000. Those are the only two things that John mentions about Jesus 16 months in Galilee. Why would he just not emphasize? Why would he not talk about the 16 months of Galilee? Well, what do we remember about John when we talked about this first? John was written later, the last of the Gospels. And Matthew, Mark, Luke were already out there. Everybody had that. There was already all kinds of stuff about the 16 months in Galilee that was available. John's goal wasn't to repeat what people already had, but to talk about what they didn't have. So his Gospel, remember we said we're going to look at five chapters of John, is just about Jesus in the upper room. John's personal witness and testimony of what happened the night before Jesus was betrayed, he gives us five chapters of that because Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't talk much about that, right? So we see this Galilean ministry, but there are two things that John thought were really important to share. The feeding of the 5,000, which we'll get to, and this story today. Maybe not one of the more popular stories, the the Herod's official and and his son that was healed, but it was important to John. So we're going to have to try and dig something out of it. You following me? You see my Dan logic working here? Well, Well, if you are, you are a brave and smart soul. All right, so um, that's kind of background where we're going. Um, So let's look now at verses 46 to 47. Um, Once he moved to visit, uh, once more he moved to visit Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus has arrived in Cana in Galilee, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. So we meet a new character here. The official 
from Herod, the royal official. So what do we know about this gentleman? Well, who was he? What does it say? It says he was a, a royal official in the NIV text. Others have a servant of Herod the king. Right? The literal Greek here is interesting. It says, one pertaining to the king. So, and there is only one king in Galilee. That was Herod. So we know where he's talking about, right? So whatever position this gentleman had, it was an important position in Herod's court. So if you want to call it a royal official or a servant of the king or one pertaining to the king, whatever it was, he had some connection with Herod. And where was he from? What can we deduce from this? Where was his sick son living? In Capernaum. And again, you saw your map there north of the Sea of Galilee. It is literally 16 miles from Cana. Uh, I think I wrote 20 on your sheet. You know how we round up always, right? But it was, I think it's literally 16 miles from Capernaum uh, to Cana. And why was he there? What do we know? Why did he show up in Cana? Because he was looking for some of that good wine that Jesus made? <laughs> no. That might have had some part of it because he had heard that Jesus had done these great miracles. And it, this man was desperate. Why was he desperate? His son was sick. So sick that he was afraid he was going to die while he was there. You kind of get the impression, if you read between the lines, don't you, that he had tried everything. He had already done all that he could. You know, uh, and isn't it interesting? Money can't buy things. Some things money can't buy. Money can't buy healing. You know, money can't buy, uh, you can purchase the best doctors in the world, but you still can't buy healing, right? He, you get the feeling he'd tried everything, and he had heard about this guy who was working these miracles. And you can read it in the context of what, we, what we've been saying, that all the folks were talking about the miracles. And what do you think they were talking about in Cana of all places? You all remember that wedding? You remember that time when Jesus was at that wedding? You all remember that wine? Holy smokes, I've never had anything like that in my life. Right? So you know the conversations were just a buzz with the miracles and the signs that Jesus was performing. So this guy shows up because he's desperate, because his son is sick. Uh, in verse 47, it says that he begged him to come and heal his son. Other, re, other translations have the word requested. The Greek, is pretty, um, the Greek is pretty clear. It's a repeated action. That's why I kind of like begging better than requesting, right? Uh, he didn't just say once, would you come? But again, in the Greek, it's like, you kind of get the feeling like he's just following Jesus around. And he's like, you know, when you're done healing that guy, would you mind coming to Capernaum? When you get an extra second healing that lady, will you have a second to walk with me to Capernaum? Here, you can even get in my chariot. I'll drive you. Right? Over and over again, he kept requesting. He kept begging. Because why? Any of us who have children who have been sick, any of us who have worried for fear of the life of our kids, can know exactly why he was desperate and why he was begging for any kind of help he could get. You follow? Right? Uh, so he requests for Jesus to come. Now, it, it's interesting. If you look at this phrase in verse 47, and if you look at what he says also in verse 49, right? In 47, he says, he begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. In verse 49, he says, sir, come down before my child dies. It reveals two things that Jesus is going to change the way he thinks about. Two mistakes that this man makes. I wrote them here on the bottom of your sheet. First, he was worried that it could be too far away for Jesus to heal the boy. Do you hear what he said? Jesus, if my son's going to get well, you're going to need to have to come with me to Capernaum. And what does he reveal in that statement? He doesn't understand that Jesus doesn't have to be present to heal his son. He doesn't understand that 16 miles for God is not a burden, is not a barrier. 16 miles for God is nothing. <laughs> but he doesn't get that, does he? He still thinks that Jesus got to come with him in order to heal the boy. We're going to see how, how Jesus blows his mind on that one. And the second mistake he makes 
is he says it could be too late for Jesus to heal the boy. He's like, come before uh, he dies because he's close to death. Come before my child dies, he says. Like, the thought is, because if you don't get there before he dies, there's no hope for him after he dies. So what does he not understand? That death for God is also not a barrier. Death doesn't have more power than God. Death cannot separate us from God's power and God's love and God's grace. So again, there's this, he doesn't get it yet, right? He's showing that he doesn't know he's not a believer yet. He's there not because he believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah of the world. Why is he there? Because he's desperate, and he's tried everything else, and this is his last-ditch effort, so he comes with this plea. Jesus, come to Capernaum and heal my son before it's too late. All good? What's Jesus' response to this heartfelt plea? Our compassionate Savior, what does he say? (laughs) Verse 48, he says, Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now, first blush, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? First blush, it sounds pretty uncaring, wouldn't you say? That doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. But what do we know about Jesus? Every word is intended for a purpose. Every word, there's a reason for why he speaks. Sometimes he speaks harshly. Sometimes he speaks compassionately. Sometimes he pushes people. And sometimes he just wraps his arm around people. He knows. He understands what the need is, and he understands the best way to meet those needs. What I'm going to argue, the, my whole point on this section, is that Jesus, as I wrote here, has a deeper concern than the life of this child. What's more important to Jesus than the life of this child on earth, his earthly life, is a deeper and abiding faith in the one who can heal that child and save that child from death. And this is, this is a message that I need to hear, and I bet you do too, that Jesus' perspective sometimes is so different than ours. You know, we get so caught up in the here and now and what we can see and what we experience and what we're going through in our aches and pains, in our soul hurts, in our cry to the God, our desperation like this man, We get so caught up in that that we miss that this is not all there is. Do you you follow? We miss sometimes that there's so much more important than the things that we see and experience around us. And Jesus doesn't miss that. And so it sounds harsh, but he's going to be harsh with all of those who are listening and with this man because he's going to want them to see that what's really important is following him not to see a miracle, not to get another glass of wine, but what's important is to know who he is and what he has really come to do in our lives. So to me, this is the the whole reason of this discussion. This is why John wanted to put this here in this point. Uh, This is why of all the things in Galilee, this is what he wanted us to know. That we follow Jesus, not because he's a miracle worker, but we follow Jesus because he is our Savior. We follow Jesus because he has power over life and power over death and gives us the gift of eternity, right? So he's going to have to slap them a few times so that they'll stop seeing the immediate need and be able to look deeper to the real need. All right, you follow me, everybody? Questions or thoughts? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, So, while the man is concerned about his son and the crowd is interested in miracles, Jesus' heart is focused on deepening people's faith. If you're filling in the blanks, right? Jesus' heart, what matters to him is deepening people's faith. So his rebuke here, I think, is towards the three blanks to fill in. Seeing is believing philosophy of the world. 
right? Jesus is rebuking that idea that if I need to see it before I'll believe it. I need to experience it here before I will understand what it is. So he really gets at that. So my last thought in this section before I move on. Have you ever noticed, have you, have you come across this in your life, that um, some things that are huge to us really don't matter that much to God? And some things that we seem to care very little about, God seems to care a whole lot about. Have you noticed that in life? So often, when I'm reading the scriptures, and the more I understand what Jesus is doing, it just seems like he's flipping everything upside down. You ever feel that way? He's like challenging my philosophy. He's challenging the way I think. He's challenging my priorities. He's getting me to think about what I'm living for. And so often, the things I think are important, God's like, are you serious? That doesn't really matter. Or the things that I think are just nothing, God says, now that's the stuff that matters. And how many times I've just gone, oh man, God, I missed it again. (laughs) You'd think after these years, I'd finally understand and get it. But he's continually reshaping my thinking and my feelings. How about you? Have you had those moments? Please. So if you couldn't hear what she was saying, and those of you online, it's sometimes that knowledge, that aha moment doesn't come for, like till after three years of praying. <laughs> after a long time and a lot of heartache, all of a sudden the answer comes and, and you go, oh, you're right, God. I'm sorry. I just wasted three years <laughs> because I didn't trust you, because I didn't see your bigger purpose. You know, uh, I pray for the wrong things a lot. I think, don't you? And that's why I have to end every one of my prayers. Not my will, God, but your will be done. Because I don't see the big picture. So often I just see this because it's like right in front of my face and it hurts. You know, or it's really concerning me and it's keeping me awake at night. And I can't see past it. And God does, doesn't he? You know, so this is, this is, this is good learnings in this section of Scripture that I think we all need. So I'm, 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 what am I gathering then from, for, if that's what we think this is about, that what God cares about is deepening our faith more than some of the things, other things that we think are important. I was able to just chunk out seven different styles of faith that I think Jesus is addressing. Again, you're not going to see this in a book anywhere. This is just silly Dan kind of stuff, right? But as I think about life and as I look at this passage of Scripture, there's different stages of faith that we kind of move through, different stages of believing uh, that we move. And, And there's a progression, one through seven, that we're going to see. But I want you to know that that even though that there's a progression, that we'll just move like this all the time. If your faith is like my faith, it is a roller coaster. There are moments when I'm on fire for God and look out devil because here I come. And there are moments when I'm on fire for the devil. (laughs) And it's look out God because I need some grace and forgiveness, right? We're all over. But I think there's a progression as we look at these seven styles of faith. So let's look at the scriptures and see what we can get at. This first, number one, the first style you can write in the blank is I call it a a signs and wonder kind of faith. A signs and wonder or a mirac- miracles kind of faith. And this is what we see immediately in our text that we've already read about, right? Why did the people welcome Jesus? What did it say? Why were they so happy that he arrived in Galilee? Verse 45. When he arrived, they welcomed him because they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they had been there. And then he was to Cana where he had turned the water into wine. So why did they come to Jesus? Because of miracles. Because of signs and wonders. So I think the very basic entry level sometimes for people knowing God is that they've heard about these signs and wonders and they want to know more. They're curious. It's just like the entry level of getting to know God sometimes. You know, people show up because they hear that miracles happen 
or God does great things, or they have a need that they're desperate for, like this man did, and they just come to God because they heard he does things. But they still don't believe, do they? They still don't have a deep abiding faith. They're just there because they're curious or because they have a need, right? So I like this. I wrote, God is gracious in that he starts with us where we are. You know, it would have been, God just could say, forget it. All you are here for miracles, go home. But he doesn't. Right? And he starts where we're at. We see this often with Jesus, don't we? Even if our faith is only as shallow as curiosity about signs and wonders, guess what? God can work with that. And he does work with that, doesn't he? He starts where we're at that way. Sadly, most of this crowd never gets beyond that lowest rung of faith. They get stuck there in the signs and wonders. You know, we read further on as we get into John how they slowly but surely begin to disappear. Look at John 6, 66. <clears throat> mm, that's not the right verse. Yeah. I thought I had it. John six sixty six. Mm-hmm. What's it say for you? After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Oh yeah, yeah. I am doy. I'm looking at the totally wrong verse. It was six. Like they started to leave. They just after this they left. So there's this journey. They didn't get the miracles. They didn't see the things that they wanted to see. Jesus wasn't the Messiah, Savior that he wanted him to be. So whoop, they leave and they go to another place. All right, so signs and wonder is step one. Step two kind of faith is what I call a crisis faith. Right? This is a desperate faith. This is the royal official who begins with emergency room faith. Right? Or you could call this also foxhole faith. Where they say there's no atheists in foxholes. Have you heard that? Right? You know, when there's a need that cries out, uh, when, there's, when there's pain that needs to be addressed, when there's healing that needs to come, right? Um, then we, we come to God also with faith. Uh, he believed that Jesus could work a miracle here. In fact, where did he come from to make this happen? He 16 miles. Either he walked it or he took his chariot, we don't know, but it was not an easy journey for him. So there's some crisis in his life that moved him to a, a deeper faith than just the crowd sign and wonder faith. In fact, here's the difference between this faith and signs and wonder faith. The only difference is that now you want Jesus to do a miracle for you. Do you see the difference? First, it's just like the crowd wants to see a miracle. Now I have a crisis, and now I need a miracle. So you see, faith has taken another step, right? And that's certainly where this man was, this official. He's taken this another step, which then uh, I think is sort of shown. I like how the first address, he says, you've got to, he begs him to heal his son who was close to death. But then in verse 49, he says, sir, come down before my child dies. See, now there's more of a need. It's a need. He has an urgency. Yep. It's to number three, which is, I call it a needing faith. A needing, N-E-E-D, a needing faith. He believed that Jesus could meet his felt need. Now here's the, here's the this is one of, the, when, when folks get to this spot, when they get to that needing faith, they are ripe for the gospel. <laughs> they are ready to hear what Jesus really came to do. Because what Jesus does here. And what he often does in our lives is he takes our felt need, right? Let's look at the difference between a felt need and a real need. He takes this official's felt need, which is, my son is sick and needs to be healed. And Jesus says, that's not really why you're here. There's a deeper need than even that. And he uses that felt need to move the man down to the real need, which is this need to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Son of God, right? That need he has to be saved and know that Jesus is God. So as I wrote here, this faith, needing faith, grows when his attitude moves from demanding to depending. 
And as soon as we move from demanding a miracle to depending on God to act, our faith has taken another step. So do you see how I'm moving on this progression from just signs and miracles to a crisis, now to addressing real needs? So now, now this guy is ready. Do you know what I'm saying? Now he, the field is ripe for Jesus to do his work. So let's look at Jesus, uh, what comes next, verse 50. Jesus replied after this last request, you may go, your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word and departed. Hmm. This now is the next step of faith. Number four, you can write in the blank, it's an acting faith. I hope you see the movement. We've moved from just wanting to see a sign or a miracle to a crisis in life that I need to get addressed to a deeper need to know what it's really all about to now trusting enough that I will act. They will take action. Uh, I'm wondering, the man, Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. Don't you love the words? It's just so simple. John says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. Would you have done that? I'm thinking I might have wanted to argue a little bit. I'm like, Jesus, I know how this works. you got to touch people. I've seen and heard how you touch people, and they get healed. You know, I've seen where you've been, and people who are in the crowd that you talk to, they get healed, right? I know how this works, Jesus. you got to come with me. You got, i got to take you to see my son in Capernaum. Let's go. Come on, Jesus. But no, he doesn't. He takes Jesus at his word. Now imagine for a second, how hard do you think it was for him to do that? Very. Oh my gosh, right? To just say, okay, <laughs> I'm going to head back the 16 miles. I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you're putting me off. I don't know if you're, if you're just trying to get rid of me because I've been pestering you and begging and begging and begging. You know, I don't know. But he trusts Jesus at his word. He takes Jesus at his word. As I was preparing this study, I stopped right here, and I just prayed. I just had a moment. And I said, God, let me have that same kind of attitude. If I could just trust Jesus at his word in all of life, I would be such a better follower or disciple of Christ. But sometimes I like to argue with Jesus. Do you ever do that? Do you know what I mean by that? You know, we just sort of want to twist his arm a little bit. Or I like to make deals with Jesus. I promise, Lord, that if you'll just answer this one prayer, I will be nice to that person at work that I can't stand. Right? Or I, I'll, put, I'll put extra $20 in the offering plate next week. Right? You know, I'll, I will volunteer, right, to be an usher, <laughs> you know, whatever. I deal with God. I bargain with God. I argue with God. But this man just shows such great confidence and trust. He takes Jesus at his word and departed. Isn't that just a powerful sense? I've missed that. I've read that sentence a thousand times, and it never really dawned on me until we were getting ready for this study, the power in those words. May that be your prayer, too. May you just take Jesus at his word. And may you depart wherever he sends, wherever he's given, wherever, whatever he's telling you to do. May you have faith to believe and trust and go. Please. When you're praying for something, I teach that for a couple of years mm -hmm. for the same thing. Mm -hmm. Are you not believing that God can do it? I mean, I've been praying for something for a long time. I'm not listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that prayer's not coming for a while, yeah. After 59 plus years, you kind of mm. <laughs> so if oh. oh so if you couldn't hear online, uh, her her great question was, you know, she's been praying for something for a long time. When do you just give up and trust Jesus? When do you stop that prayer? So here's the story. I think you've got to trust your own spirit, right? We're told in the Bible to be persistent. 
we're told to pray without ceasing, right? We, we know that's true. And, um, and we need to do that. But there also comes a time where you have to trust your spiritual sense. There may be a time when Jesus just says to you, it's time to depart. It's time for you just to go and move. And I don't think there is a black and white sort of like rule book for that. Pray seven times, 70 times, and then stop. You know, you just have to listen, know your heart, know your spirit, know your prayers, uh, and then go with what God's telling you. So I think, I've heard people say, never stop. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there are times where Jesus is going to tell you, all right, that's enough. We're not going to go that direction. That's not where I want you to go. This is not the way things are going to work. So move. Take me at my word and depart. But I don't know how to tell you when you reach that point. See, that's the hard thing, because I don't know if there is a, a right way to know when that is. That's what I mean. You just have to... There comes a point where you just have to trust your relationship with God, trust your prayers, and then move. How's that for a great political answer? <laughs> it is different for every person. Good point. You know, every, every situation in, is different. So you just have to pray and trust and listen and move and then like Luther said, sin boldly. <laughs> do what you got to do and just move forward, right? It's a good question. Isn't it though? Right. He said it's hard for us to see it his way all the time because we always want our way. Sometimes we're like the stubborn little pouty children. God, I want this. I want this. I'm not going to stop praying until you give it to me. And that's when I say sometimes God says, no, stop. Let it go. Take me at my word and depart. Move in another direction. There comes a point, and I wish I knew when that point was. Couldn't tell you. You got to figure that one out, you and God. All right, moving on, everybody. Good. So this is this acting faith time. Um, so Jesus is not trying to get rid of the man, is he? He's trying to help them to go deeper. So instead of, you know, I love this next sentence. Instead of doing what the man asks Jesus, Jesus puts the man in a position where he must do what Jesus asks. He flips the tables. Jesus loves to do that. Jesus says, uh, the man says, you come with me to Capernaum. And Jesus says, no, how about you trust me and you go to Capernaum. Puts the ball in his court. Says, now you go, you trust me. And again, uh, I, I had one of these aha moments. So often God does that in the Bible. You know, so often God says, you want to be cured of leprosy? Well, first, you go to the river and wash, right? Uh, he often will do things like that. He'll say, all right, you, you want this prayer answered? Well, go. Trust me. Take me at my word and go. And as we go, God brings the healing. And that's exactly what he did here. As the man goes, uh, we're going to see he's not even home yet, and his servants show up with the good news. By the way, that's not the first time that's happened, right? Where people show up with good news that things that Jesus has been at work before folks even got home to hear it. And why? Because I think the point is, it's the acting. As, as we act, God works. Now, let's not... Let's not be not Lutheran here. Let's not right, get all crazy. Our acting makes God work? Is that what we said? No. That's not true. That's works righteousness stuff. Right? You can't bargain with God. You can't, it's not your actions that motivate God. But what God loves to do is take faith in action and make it grow. Do you see? The gift of faith as we use it, the gift of faith as we move in acting on it, God flowers it into fruit. And that's certainly what we're seeing going on here. So the official then is faced with life's greatest decision. Jesus makes a promise and he's forced to decide whether or not to believe. It's a moment for him, is it? I bet he's going to look back someday and tell his kids, you remember, but you're not... Some kid's going to say, around the campfire at Door County at Peninsula State Park. Dad, 
When did you really know that Jesus was the one? And he's going to go, son, <laughs> it was that moment when he told me to go. And I trusted him, and I took him at his word. And before I even got home, he had answered my prayer. That's when I knew. This was a moment for him. It's this crossroads moment in his faith. He took Jesus at his word. So how do we move from a needing faith to an acting faith? How do we take that step? It's easy. When we decide to obey. As soon as we decide to obey, to take Christ at his word, and when we step out in faith, God acts to accomplish great things in our lives and in the kingdom. Remi remember, reminding ourselves, it's not works righteousness, right? It's not our actions that move God, but God moves through our actions to accomplish great things. All right, verses 51 and 50. Is it really 5-2? Oh, my God. 9-2. Oh, 9-2. Okay, good. <laughs> verses 51 and 52. I don't know what happens to the time. So the man took Jesus' word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. So the next step of faith after this acting faith, I just made this up. I call it a knowing faith. K-N-O-W-I-N-G. A knowing faith. Now, he didn't just believe the promise. Now he had the evidence. Now he knew that God was amazing, that God had answered his prayers, that God had healed his boy. Uh, he knew God had worked in a miraculous way. Uh, I'm going to skip this next section on uh, long-distance healing thing because I want to get to some other things. Uh, maybe if we have time, I'll zip through it real at the end. So skip that box for now. Two things I want you to notice about this knowing faith. I think it's cool. The father's faith, not the son's faith, brought healing. So here's this boy who's sick in Capernaum. All of a sudden, he gets healed. Was it his deal? I mean, where'd the healing come from? It was the father's faith that God blessed and worked through to bring healing. So my thought is, our faith can directly impact another person's life. So please don't ever think that your faith, your prayers for another person don't really matter. Please don't think if you've been in persistent prayer for someone to know the Lord or for some relationship to be restored or for some healing to come, right? please don't think that, that it doesn't matter or it doesn't make a difference because it does. What if this guy never took that step? What if he said, this guy doesn't really care. He's just trying to get rid of me. Right? And then stuck around and had some more wine in Cana and Galilee for a while. His son would have never been healed. <laughs> Do you follow me? Our faith matters. Our faith makes a difference. Uh, and then, I love this, Jesus did more with this man's faith than he even expected. God so often does that. Uh, it, what was his prayer? He, he, uh, what did he ask the servants when they show up? When did he start getting better? What does that mean? He doesn't think he's fully better yet. But what did God do? Did God partially heal him? Did Jesus just start the process of healing? What did they say? Dude's better. <laughs> He's healed. Completely healed. God did even more than have thought or asked for. So how do we move from, you know, from, from this knowing faith to the next? We move from acting faith to knowing faith when we decide to take Jesus at his word. Verses 53 to 54. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. So six, uh, the sixth step is a believing faith. Or you could call it a trusting faith. Look how far this man had come. From just showing up for a miracle, for just showing up for a crisis, for just showing up because his son was sick, to taking a step of faith, to seeing how that step of faith was honored and blessed by God with a knowing that his son was healed, to now believing in him, this is the word, so that he and all his household believed. 
So look, Jesus has this deep desire to move us from a faith that's based on the signs he can work or the crisis we're in to a faith that's based on our experiences of his faithfulness. Come on, folks. When we are in the presence of Christ's faithfulness, when we experience God's goodness in our lives, doesn't your soul just light up? Doesn't your heart just burst? Doesn't your, your mind just explode with the possibilities? Don't you just feel like you are in the right place at the right time? When you experience God's presence and love and care like that, doesn't everything just seem to fall into place and make sense? Don't you feel like you're on top of the world? Anybody? Really? See, that's where we're moving now. This, this is the faith that God wants to develop in us. This was Jesus' point all along, to get this man to this place where he understood who he was, who Jesus was, what life in the kingdom was all about, and God's blessings and power in his life. And that changed everything for him, didn't it? And that's where we want to be. That's where Jesus wants us to be. That's, and if you've been in that sweet spot, ooh, it's a good place, isn't it? That's like Peter who says, it is good to be here. Right, the transfiguration, it's good. I'm building a tent because I am never leaving the sweet spot. Right, that's, that's the goal that's, that Jesus is moving us to. So I'm reading, the official moved from faith in the miracles of Jesus to faith in the promise of Jesus, finally to faith in the experience of Jesus. Do you see that movement? And this is why I said earlier, see, there's a progression in my thinking here with these seven stages, but don't we just zip, zap, zip, zap, zip? I mean, there are moments when I'm, I'm stuck in the miracle phase. There are moments when I'm stuck in the promise phase. There are moments when I'm, when I'm finally to the experience phase. But I'm like this all the time because, as we say, I am a poor, miserable sinner, <laughs> right? And so I, I just keep flopping back and forth. But does God ever give up? Does Jesus ever stop growing and challenging and feeding? Never, ever. Never, ever. So finally we get to that last step. The last step of faith is a shared faith. Remember, because he said, so he and who believed? He and his whole household believed. So he didn't just keep this inside. And household here in the Greek doesn't mean his mom, his dad, and his kids, and his wife. Household is his circle of influence. So where did we say the guy was? In Herod's court? So who heard the good news of the, this healing? Who heard the good news of this Jesus who wasn't just a miracle worker, but a guy who, who knew him and understood him? Herod's whole household knew and believed. So there are some cool things um, that you just wonder about. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. I've always wondered about this. Luke 8, verse 1. Did you all find Luke 8? It says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And who was traveling with him? It says, The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Now check this out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, who what? Was the manager of Herod's household. That word, manager of Herod's household in the Greek, is the same word that's used in John for Herod of the royal, uh, royal servant, right, who was a member of Herod's court. It's the same Greek word. Could it be that Cusa was the gentleman that we're talking about here? Do you think? I mean, we don't know for sure. It might just be another guy in Harris household. But maybe, I don't know, I, get, I just like that kind of stuff. Maybe it's Cusa. And so maybe he didn't just go home and tell everybody about this great event. But maybe he started following Jesus around, traveling with him, sharing the good news, Taking that step of faith. Would that be cool or what? When we get to heaven, I hope I meet Kuza. Because I want to ask him if he was the one. Right? There's that one that's, that's good. And um, maybe, again, 
Acts chapter 13. You want to turn there? Acts chapter 13. There's another kind of another kind of reference that I wonder. Acts 13, Barnabas and Saul are sent off, and it says in verse 1, in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and then here, check this out. Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So here's another guy who was in the family of Herod, who was sharing the good news of Jesus. How did he ever hear about Jesus in Herod's household? Who told him? How did he hear? I wonder if it was Cusa, who told Manian about Jesus, and now all kinds of people in Herod's court know that Jesus is the Lord and are telling the good news and sharing the story and have experienced Jesus in their life. I don't know. Maybe they're completely unrelated. (laughs) But would it surprise or shock you if it were true? Because here's how it works. If you've had a child that was miraculously healed, if you experience Jesus' power in your life, you can't keep it inside. You can't just bury it. You want to tell, don't you? you got to share it. you got to tell others so that they too can know and experience. And so that's the, that's the way it works. That's the way God is at work. Yes? When Jesus, as he's arrested, is sent to Herod, Herod said he wanted to meet him because of the miracles that that had done from good John Mark. See how it all connects? Uh, everything Jesus does has a plan. It, there's a reason for it. So hopefully, everybody, you, you, uh, my prayer for you today is that, again, you've been encouraged to see that God's goal for you is more than just the things that you can see here in this world. He's got a deeper goal, which was to deepen your faith. Remember, that was the title of the message, the, the, the story here, the Bible study, to deepen your faith, and that you too will move from just miracles to experiencing and sharing the faith of your Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen, everybody? Amen. Good study? Amen. Awesome. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. He was moving her to a a bigger...